you have your Bibles with you tonight, I invite you to open them to 1 Samuel chapter 17. On Sunday night, we're in a sermon series. This is message number three in that series entitled, The Life and Times of David. You had a seminary education on the life of Moses this summer. It's my intent to give you a seminary education on the life of David. And tonight we're going to be looking at a message entitled, Lessons on Facing Giants. Lessons on Facing Giants. David is going to face a giant. And you and I are going to face giants in our life too. And the principles that David employed to bring down his giant are the principles that we employ to bring down ours. The Bible's not just a book about the past. It's a book about the present. It's not just about David, but it's about you and I. It's not just about Goliath, but it's about the giants you and I face as we go through this world in preparation for the world to come. By the way, this world's not our home. Our home's in heaven. 1 Samuel 17. Let's read verse 3 through 10. And we read, The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a vast valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. He was from Gath. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went out before him to block arrows and spears that might be fired or thrown at him. And then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. Goliath said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants, speaking of the Philistines. But if I prevail against him and murder him, then you shall be our servants, and you will serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. The story is simple. Profoundly simple. Let me give you my version of the story that you just read. Fifteen little sentences or points. And I'm going to retell that story to you. Now if you want to follow me through the verses we just read, you may. But let's look at these, the story of David and Goliath. The simple story that everybody knows in some way, shape, or form. The Israelites and the Philistines are arch enemies. They don't get along. Their hatred and their hostility toward one another runs deep. And they are now facing off in preparation for battle. The Israelites are on one side. The Philistines are on the other. And separating them, who are both on high ground, is a valley in between them. Neither side wants to go into the valley. Because if you go into the valley, you're leaving high land to go into low land and you become vulnerable in the conflict, in the battle. So the Israelites are saying, Philistines, you come on down into the valley and we'll fight you. The Philistines are saying, no, Israelites, you come down into the valley and we will fight you. They're both wanting high ground position. In this stalemate that's incurred, 
The Israelites on, on high ground over here, Philistines on high ground over here, valley in between. Nobody's making a move, but they're calling each other names and they're threatening one another. The Philistines come up with a plan to perhaps resolve this. They will send their champion. In boxing terms, he would be a world champion. They're going to send Goliath into the valley. He is the Philistine champion. He is unbeaten. He has never been beat in conflict. He's never been beat in battle. Every man that's ever went against him, he has killed them. So they send Goliath into the valley. He's their best warrior, and he represents their army. He represents their nation. He represents their God. Did you get that? Goliath. He represents the army of the Philistines. He represents the nation of Philistine. And he represents the God that they worship. So he, is, he represents a lot of different things as he walks into that valley to face off against the Israeli opponent. Now, the scriptures tell us a little bit about Goliath. He is a human tank. He's nine foot, six inches tall. Think about that. Nine foot, six inches tall. He weighs about 600 plus pounds. How would you like to invite him over for dinner? He'd eat all your groceries in one meal. Over 600 pounds in body weight. He's covered in armor. From the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, from left to right, from right to left, from down to up, and to up to down. He's carrying on his 600-pound body weight 125 pounds of armor. Wow. He carries a spear. The spear has a head on it that weighs 15 pounds by itself. He's escorted by a shield bearer who goes out before him and holds a giant shield up to block any arrows that his opponent might shoot or to block any spears that might be thrown at him. He's unbeaten, as I said, in combat. Can you imagine the sight of this giant walking into that valley and calling out to the Israelites, Send me your man. We will battle, win or take all. If I beat you, your people become captives to the Philistines. If you beat me, my people will become captive to you, the Israelites. Instead of the whole army fighting, it's just going to be me and you. And the Israelites quickly found somebody and threw him out there. I'm just checking you. Some of y'all nod your head on everything. No. The Israelites were trembling. There wasn't a man in their army that wanted to go into that valley and face off against Goliath. It was signing their death certificate. And for 40 days, this giant walks into the valley. He curses the army of Israel. He curses the nation of Israel. He profane and vulgarizes the God of Israel. He is a foul-mouthed, profane, vulgar man. He's wicked to the core. And he taunts the Israelites to send somebody. And nobody wants to go. Now, we might sit back here and say, I would. No, you wouldn't. And neither would I. Nobody wants to, to sign their death certificate. After 40 days, finally, there's a young man visiting the army of Israel. He's bringing food from his father to his brothers who serve in that army. The one who comes bearing the food for his brothers who serve in the army of Israel is David. And David listens to what Goliath says. What Goliath says about the army of Israel. You're a bunch of cowards. You bunch of sissies. 
He listens to what Goliath says about the the nation of Israel. This nation is full of weak people. You don't deserve to even have a nation. God should wipe you off the face of the earth. And then he talks about their God. He cusses at their God. He puts his middle finger up in the air at their God. He dares their God to do something. And the Israelites do do something. They cower down and panic. And David says this is not to be. I will not have somebody curse my brothers in the army of Israel. I will not have somebody curse God's chosen nation, Israel. I will not have somebody curse my God. I will battle him. And David, a teenage boy, a shepherd boy, goes out to face Goliath. What do you think was on Goliath's mind when he saw David come? Y'all ever think about things like that, speculate? I believe Goliath laughed. I, th- I, th- I think he thought it was funny. This is a joke. You've you got to be kidding. And then I think his laughter turned to anger because this was an insult to him. I, I think he thought King Saul might come out and battle him. But Saul was a coward. I, maybe he thought a, another warrior would come out. But they weren't. They were afraid. And so here comes David, a shepherd boy. He doesn't have any armor on. There's no armor to fit him. He's too small. He doesn't know how to use a sword. He doesn't know how to use a spear. He doesn't know how to use bow and arrows. All he knows how to use is a slingshot. And so David goes out to battle Goliath in his street clothes, his shepherd clothes, you might say. With a slingshot and five stones in his little pouch. And he charges at Goliath. He runs at Goliath. He doesn't run away from him. He runs right at him. And while Goliath is laughing, while Goliath is raising his spear, while he's preparing to throw that spear and split David in half with it, David's moving fast. He's zigzagging. He ain't running in a straight line. And Goliath is trying to get his bead on him. And then David, who has guided rocks in his pouch. We got guided missiles. He had guided rocks. And he took that slingshot. Paused a moment after he zigzagged, got close enough to Goliath. He pulled it back, stone number one, and he fired it. He wouldn't need stone number two, three, four, or five. Because that stone, guided by the hand of God, struck Goliath right between the eyes. Buried itself right between his eyes. And Goliath's eyes rolled back in his head. He began to shake and quiver. And he collapsed to the ground. Boom! The armor bearer took off and ran. And David went to the fallen Goliath. And pulled out his big sword. And David took his head off his shoulders and held it up for all to see. Now the Philistines who were supposed to surrender, they took off for running. And they're still running today. (laughs) That's the story of David and Goliath. Goliath is dead, David has won. David has beaten Goliath. Israel has beaten the Philistines. And the God of heaven has defeated the Philistine God of Dagon. Now, that's the story. That's the story we read to our children and grandchildren. Maybe not quite in that detail. But that's really not what I want us to focus on. 
Because the Bible is not just a book about facts, it's also a book about principles. In fact, the Bible really is a principle book. Every story is simple. But the profoundness of each story is what God wants us to understand and learn the principles. Because remember, you and I one day are going to face a what? A giant. Some of you have already been facing them. Some of you are facing them now. I can promise you if you're sitting here saying, I've never faced one, you will. There's giants in this world. What can we learn from this story to prepare us for that day when we will battle our giants? Five lessons I want to give to you real quick tonight. First of all, there's a lesson on problems for us. A lesson on problems. David was a human being. Human beings who live in this fallen world are going to have problems. You got that? But pastor, I'm a Christian. You're going to have problems. Pastor, I'm a super Christian. You're going to have problems. Pa pastor, I'm a man of great faith. I'm a woman of great faith. I'm glad you are. You're going to have problems. Our faith is not a vaccination or an immunization from problems. I know that's what some of these TV preachers tell you. Listen, they're just telling you a bunch of baloney. Because they want to reach their hand in your pocket and get out some money out of your pocket. The Christian life has problems in it. And God's people, no matter who they are, saint or whatever, they have problems too. A man that is born into this world is going to have trouble. So David had problems. He had troubles. He had struggles. He had challenges. All of us are going to have them. All of us do have them. And more is to come. Think about David's problems for just a moment. He, first of all, he had a father that was prejudiced and biased against him. David had multiple brothers. Remember when Samuel went looking in the house of Jesse for a king? And Jesse said, let me go get my boys. One of them will do it. But he didn't bring David. David was the only son he left out. He brought the oldest son. He brought all the other sons. But he didn't bring David. Why? Because he favored the other brothers more than David. That's, that's, that hurts, doesn't it? When parents show bias or prejudice or favoritism to one child over another. Now, we might treat our children differently, but we should love them the same. Amen? Well, David, he had, he had problems. He had a father that was biased. He also had brothers that were critical. The brothers are always putting him down. He's the run in the litter and they make sure he knows that. So he's got a father who's biased as he's growing up. He's got brothers that are critical of him. They put him down. They mock him. They laugh at him. They don't think that he's going to amount to anything but just watching sheep. David also battles with loneliness. He's a shepherd. He's a solo shepherd. He's out taking care of sheep from morning to evening. That's all. It's just him and the sheep. He doesn't have a wife out there with him. He doesn't have any children out there with him. Doesn't have any grandchildren out there with him. Doesn't have any brothers out there with him. It's just him. As he carries out the responsibilities his father gave to him in regard to the sheep, it's just him. Can you imagine the loneliness? There's only many, so many songs you can sing, Keith. There's only so many things you can do to entertain yourself. So David, here he is, a young man. He's facing the problems of life that a young man his age might would face, just like we do. A prejudiced father, critical brothers, an occupation that is a lonely occupation. 
not only lowly, lonely. And then the, he also says in the Bible that he had to guard the sheep. Part of his responsibility was not only to feed the sheep and medicate the sheep, but it was also to protect the sheep. Protect them from what? Lions, tigers, and bears. David the shepherd boy, he watched the Wizard of Oz. I'm kidding some of y'all. Y'all sit out there going, I didn't know you knew it was on. I didn't know David had a television. Yeah, he had a color one. But David had the responsibility of taking care of the sheep. And when lions would come and try to get one for a meal, David fought the lions and killed the lions. He fought the bears and killed the bears. He fought all the predators who came. He's just a shepherd boy. He had a staff and he had a slingshot, yet God used him in all of that to hone his skills for fighting. But in each problem that I just told you, the, the biased father, the critical brothers, the, the, the lowliness and loneliness of his occupation, and the constant battles that he had to fight against predators, God was with him. You see, David understood a principle, I hope we will, God is with us, and God is able. Even though David's father was biased, he had a heavenly father who loved him. Maybe you're here right now and you say, my parents never loved me. Your heavenly father loves you. Do you know that? And he cares for you. He believes in you. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And so David got from the Father in heaven what his earthly father wouldn't give him. David got from the Father in heaven what his brothers wouldn't give him, and that was affirmation. The Lord spoke highly of David. He's a man after my own heart. The Lord spoke of and comforted David and encouraged David with his words. Are you picking this up? What you don't get this way, God can supply this way. And David was lonely. But there was somebody out there with him when he did, took care of those sheep. It was God himself. So God, he gave testimony of David. He praised him. He was gracious to him. He was there with him to give him fellowship. And those wild animals that David had to fight, he didn't kill them. God killed them through him. So understand, you're going to have problems. David had problems. And the problem he was facing in our story was Goliath. But he had other problems long before that, didn't he? You got it now? Prejudiced father, critical brothers, a lowly, lonely position, and wild animals to protect the sheep from. God took care of David. And David's faith grew. Every time God does something and, and increases our faith, we should trust him that much more for something else. Because the Lord usually starts out with little giants. And he grows them up as our faith increases. But the second thing I want us to see is not only a lesson on problems. We're all going to have problems. And those problems sometimes are going to be giants. And God is using the things that we go through on a small scale to prepare us for the large scale. Okay? David just doesn't walk out and kill Goliath. He has the confidence that he can fight Goliath because he's fought lions, tigers, and bears. If God can kill a four-legged creature, God can kill a two-legged one too. Secondly, a lesson on perspective. There's more to this story, as I said earlier, than meets the eye. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. The great apostle Paul writes this to us. He says, put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now look up here at me. A lesson on problems. We're all going to have problems. And they're going to get bigger as we grow older and our faith increases. A lesson on perspective. Pay attention. Goliath was a real person who was real in every way the Bible talks about. He's not imaginary. He's not a fable. He's not a fairy tale. He's not an illusion. Goliath was a real wicked man. He was real. And he represented Satan. He was a picture of a man that Satan had chosen to represent the powers of darkness in a showdown against God himself and David representing the power of light. Everything in the Bible has a purpose. In verse 4, Goliath was six cubits high. In verses 5 through 7, he was six pieces of armor on. He also had 600 shekels of, in his uh, weight spear. Why do you think that number six, six, six keeps coming up? Because that's the number of who? Satan. God's number 777. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan counterfeits everything God does. He's not creative, but he's a good counterfeit. And in the tribulation period, he will introduce to the world the unholy trinity. He himself will substitute himself for God the Father. The Antichrist will substitute himself for God the Son. The false prophet will substitute himself for God the Spirit. And here we're getting a picture of it happening even before the tribulation. Goliath is a representation of Satan. He's a representation of Satan. And David is also a real person. He's not a wicked man like Goliath. He's a righteous young man. And he represents who? The Lord Jesus. Now, this is important for you to understand because this is not Goliath versus David. Do you understand that? This is Satan versus God. A showdown. 777 versus 666. So this is more than just two men fighting. There's more at stake here than just two armies battling. This is the Lord Jesus versus Satan. And by the way, Satan always loses. It's the third lesson. You've got a lesson on problems. Raise your hand if you're going to have some problems one day. Raise it up. Okay, thank you. Raise your hand if you've already had some problems. Okay, thank you. I love an honest group because I had a second message ready to do if you didn't. Raise your hand. Less than on problems, we're going to have them. But God prepares us for them. One step at a time. One faith at a time. And every time the problem grows, our faith will grow. Our trust in Him will increase. And then the perspective is we always have to understand that there's a spiritual side and there's a physical side. We see the physical side. We see the iceberg above water. But underneath that water line, there's a much bigger iceberg. And that iceberg represents the spiritual side that's taking place. How Satan wants to use representations of himself, symbols of himself, to try to take us down. And God steps in and says, you're my man, you're my woman, and I'm going to be with you. We, the powers of life and light, are going to defeat the powers of death and darkness. Thirdly, 
There's a lesson here on participation. Participation. In verse 32, we're looking for somebody to fight Goliath. Remember, 40 days have went by. He's used every profane word he can imagine. He's used every vulgar word you can imagine. He's done every vile act you can imagine. He has cussed out the army of Israel. He has cussed out the nation. He's cussed out God. Forty days he's done that. And not one single Israelite will step up and answer the call. Verse 32. David says, I will fight. You'll never have victory over a problem, particularly when there's a spiritual element, which there often is in every problem. You will never have victory until you agree that you're going to fight. Does that make sense to you? You can't win unless you play the game. And David says, I'm tired of him putting down my nation and my, and my army, but most of all, I'm tired of him putting down my God. David saw the challenge, he saw the need, he saw the opportunity, and he said, Lord, here am I. I will fight him. The greatest decisions in life are when we make a decision to stand for truth and righteousness. When we choose to stand for God against things in this world orchestrated by Satan to defeat us. And yet we're going to fight it. Do you think David was afraid? Let's be honest. I mean, he's walking out into a valley all alone, a shepherd boy. The nation of Israel is on his shoulders. The army of Israel is on his shoulders. And maybe God is on his shoulders. And he walks out into that valley by himself. Thousands of people are watching. It's like an arena, a football game taking place in this valley. Except it's not a football game. It's a fight to the death. Winner take all. And David's walking out and there is Goliath. I think when he's reaching into that pouch, his hand is shaking. That slingshot's like that. He's zigging and zagging. And he's sweating. Because see, we have the privilege of looking back, don't we? We see the story. He didn't see all of this. A bully told all the kids on the playground at school, if you stay on this playground, I'm going to beat you up. And they all left with their tail tucked between their legs. All of them left because the bully said, you stay here, I'm going to beat you up. They took off, all except for one little boy. Man, the, boy, the, the bully said, didn't you hear what I said? The little boy said, I heard what you said. Aren't you afraid of me? And the little boy said, I'm afraid of you. But I'm no chicken. Are you a chicken? Am I a chicken? It's okay to be afraid. But we ain't no chicken. And David wasn't either. And he walked into that valley to battle Satan's representation of Goliath. Fourth lesson. Lesson on promise. We're going to have problems. Lesson on perspective. Our problems are always probably deeper than what we can see. There's a spiritual issue always in every physical problem. Participation. There comes a time when we need to quit trembling and we need to step up because we ain't chickens. We're sons and daughters of God and we will face what God has put in our path or allowed to come into our path. We will face it. We're not going to run. We're going to face it. Then there's a lesson on power. Notice verse 47. David says the battle 
is the Lord's. No wonder he had a heart for God. Because David could see things nobody else could see. Spiritual people always see what other people can't see. David understood just as he had fought with the bears and beat them, just as he fought with tigers and beat them, just as, as he had fought with, with lions and beat them, he was now going to fight a two-legged animal. And he was going to beat him. Oh, he was scared. But he was determined to fight and he was also believed he would win. Because who was going to do the fighting for David? God. If you think this story is about David and Goliath, take your glasses on and put them on again and get your spiritual glasses. Because this is not David versus Goliath. This is God versus Goliath. And God's bigger than Goliath. That's a good place for an amen. Goliath was big, strong. He was armed. But David's God was bigger, stronger, and better armed. And if God is for us, who can be against us? You see how all this flows together? Lastly, a lesson on promise. God always keeps his word. That's why it's important that you read your Bible. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible has promises in it. When God makes a promise, God keeps a promise. He's the original promise keeper. What did God promise David? Long before David ever stepped out into that valley to fight Goliath, God had made a promise to that shepherd boy. He would be the next what? He would be the next king. Samuel represented the Lord. He went to the house of Jesse. One by one they came. Samuel examined each of them. The Holy Spirit said, not him, not him, not him. When all the brothers were examined, Samuel said, Jesse, do you have any more sons? I, I, I know that what I'm looking for is here, but I, I don't have, I just don't have the freedom from what you've given to me to choose from to choose them. Jesse, do you have a stepson? Do you have a, an, a, an adopted son? Do you maybe have you have another blood son? Do you have another son? And Jesse said, Well, I, I do, but he's, he's just a run. He's just a little teenage boy. He's a shepherd. He's not very educated. He's not a military man. He doesn't know how to use weapons. He doesn't have a lot of experience in life. And Samuel says, Bring him. And you know the story. David came and the prophet Samuel looked at him and said, that's him. He will be the next king of Israel. He will be the next king of Israel. And David heard that. I don't know if he truly understood the ramifications of that. But he understood that when King Saul was taken off the throne, David would be the next king of Israel. If David would have died fighting Goliath, God would have what? Lied. And God does not lie. What am I saying to you? David versus Goliath was rigged. It, the fix was on. I don't know if the mafia was behind it. <laughs> they like to bet money on things and then predict the outcome. But David knew that Goliath had to die because if David would have died, he wouldn't be the king of Israel and God would have lied to him. So I submit to you, David could have walked out backwards. He could have taken his slingshot and shot the, the rock the whole 180 degrees away from Goliath. And I submit to you, that rock would have done... 
That would have been something to see. That rock turning in midair and heading back toward Goliath. See, David understood that what God says, God does. And God said, you will be the king. And David said, I believe it. And therefore, I will conduct myself accordingly. Problems? Yeah, we're going to have them, but God is able. Perspective? Yes. Every challenge, every struggle, every problem has a physical element and a spiritual element to it. You've got to understand that or you won't be able to fight it effectively. Participation? There comes a time when we've got to fight. There comes a time when you've got to stand up against things that are wrong, against things that are, 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 are dark, against things that are wicked, against things that are foolish. Comes a time to take a stand. You've got to speak out. power we trust God to fight our battles and church we really need to understand that in the days in which we live persecution is going to come against the church how do we fight that persecution when it comes we fight it on our knees churches that will fight on their knees they will find the battles are rigged we're going to win and churches who try to fight in the flesh believe a politician or a political party or this or that can save them, they're going to go down crashing in defeat. And the promises of God are what we pray about. We pray back His promises. And God always honors His word. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. So this was a story about David tonight. 